so today's episode, we're going to talk about how do you heal if your abuser is continuing the same actions or the addiction is still going or whatever it is that's causing that betrayal trauma. How do you heal from that? Hi, welcome back to Come Off Conqueror Show. I'm your host, Bonnie, and with me today is Erin Anderson again. She is the host of a podcast, and she does some Facebook groups and all those things that focus on betrayal trauma and helping us overcome that. And if you saw her previous episode where we talked about overcoming betrayal trauma, I'll uh, link that down below so you can see that. If you missed it, it was really, really good. We talked about... um, overcoming that trauma by healing yourself first and how it's essential to heal from that kind of trauma um, without expecting your spouse or your abuser, whoever betrayed you to heal first. And I love what she said that we, we sometimes are conditioned to think that healing um, happens after they've apologized or they've forgiven you or things like that, or they've, um, you expect an apology first in order to heal. Right. But that often doesn't happen. And that apology often doesn't come and neither does the changed behavior. So before we let Aaron answer that question, go ahead and hit like comment, share the video. Let's get this message out. Let's help all those women out there who were dealing with betrayal trauma and were so deeply hurt. Let's help them find the healing and the answers that they're looking for. All right, Erin, welcome back. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me again. Um, in true uh, technology fashion, we actually didn't leave. We're still in our same spots. <laughs> yeah, some same clothes, so she, so you can see. That works. Um, <laughs> we just paused it. The video we switched to do it. I know, sneaky, sneaky. Okay, so Erin, let's talk about. In the last episode, in the last segment, you. Um, shared how your husband had a pornography addiction, Mm -hmm. but what ended up happening is as you started healing yourself and your own heart, and you came into your own truth, realizing that you weren't a victim, that you were a daughter of God. And that led to your whole new identity. All these beautiful things happened as you created that space of healing for you. It ended up creating a space of healing for your spouse. Absolutely. And he started to change and heal himself. And another truth that you shared was that you realized that he himself was going through his own trauma Mm -hmm. and that the addiction was a symptom of that trauma, that he was trying to heal from that in some pretty destructive ways. Yep. And so that was kind of a recap of what we talked about, but now let's talk about what happens if, while you're finding your own healing, what if your abuser doesn't change? What if that addiction doesn't stop? How do you continue to heal yourself without that change behavior, without that apology? I know that is for me personally, extremely difficult. I have a really hard time forgiving somebody without an apology. That's so hard for me. So what do you do in that situation? How do you counsel us to get over it? I mean, maybe that's the wrong choice of words, but you know what I mean? (laughs) How to heal from it. Yes. Right. Um, so there's a couple of different ideas that I have for this. Number one, if that's what you listener are dealing with, just know that, Um, I have so much respect and love for you because that's a hard situation, even harder than the one that I went through, because obviously I've stayed, I was able to stay married. I love my husband even more. He loves me even more. We have created like just such a fantastic little corner of our own paradise because of our healing. Um, And that's not something that you're able to see right now, right? Um, But one thing that I've realized as I've been coaching women for the last 10 years is the level of addiction in the husband um, has three different categories. And one, it's very mild. 
okay? Meaning that the husband actually hates the fact that they have an addiction. They hate the fact that they look at porn. Um, they feel terrible, and it actually creates more trauma in their lives. Um, but they're a bit more aware of it, and they actually want to do something about it. The middle one is um, they're not really super open to change. Mm. Um, they're usually pretty verbally not okay. I wouldn't necessarily go so far as to say abusive, but um, well, oftentimes they are, to be okay. honest with you. Sometimes, oftentimes they are. Sometimes the things that they say is very not okay and very abusive and blaming the wife for like it's all her fault right um, so like a lot of gaslighting and a lot of gaslighting in there a lot of gaslighting. not accepting responsibility for their actions so yes. do they feel like um they're not um or is it like they're in victim mode like they think they're they victim. are in victim mode but they refuse to admit it okay like they refuse to admit it like the the mild guy the the mild guy he's like he believes he's the entire problem okay. right um which isn't necessarily a healthy mindset either but like you can actually work with these guys the mild guys a bit more the medium ones um they could go either way okay right but on the really really hardcore uh abusers they are physically abusive mentally emotionally they will do anything to destroy you and to re and keep power right yeah like, yes power struggle yes. is it's um they tend to be more narcissists and power yes. sociopathic and, yes yeah. okay and those guys are just dangerous and so if that's the case if you're in that relationship um, immediately <laughs> I'm going to tell you get out because your safety is definitely uh, in jeopardy here in every single way. Okay. Um, this guy, there's a good chance. I would say 75% chance that you may need to leave 25% um, chance that he might change down here. hundred percent. You can actually shift that. I have yet to see a relationship with this guy that hasn't been able to change where he's able to actually shift into something better. Okay. So saying that if your husband is someone who is resistant to change, he's in one of these two categories, the middle okay. or the hard. Okay. Um, and we're not just talking about addicts here, everybody, like we're talking yeah. about any sort of form of abuse and, mm -hmm. um, you know, addicts obviously have a whole nother layer mm -hmm. <laughs> to what's going on mentally, but um, this really falls under any sort of abuse. I would say that abuse in of itself is actually a form of addiction. You think so? Really? Why yes. is that? Because it has the same um, tendencies to fire different parts of the brain. Oh, so, okay. um, like, abuse is actually an addiction if you consider like what it gives them like the dopamine high or something the dopamine high it's it's their next fix it's the i'm better than you i i'm not wrong i refuse to be wrong whereas and so that's actually an addictive mentality it's a, it's an addictive pathway so they're and the reason dominant or something yes yes dominance and mm, i would even say like 99 percent of the time even if pornography is not something that the wife is aware of it's definitely there <laughs> oh okay so i yeah i've never i i've never seen um a guy that is like heavily you said that doesn't have porn problem yeah that doesn't have a porn problem oh Man, yeah, it's just so prevalent these days. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. And now I say that and I can almost kind of feel like somebody listening to this going, oh, crap. Right. <laughs> but um, the whole idea with healing from these two relationships, the the 
mid and the hard end um, is your intention. It really seriously comes back to your intention, which is the first pillar of living an unashamed life, right? Um, what do you truly intend for your life? Um, you've got to sit down or go somewhere or do something to get intentional. One of my favorite places to get intentional is actually in front of the sink doing the dishes. There's <laughs> something about cleaning that mm -hmm. actually helps you get really intentional. Okay. It's like okay. cleaning that helps you clean up your mind or something. Yes. And uh, I don't know if you know who Jenny Layton is. Mm. Um, she's an organization coach. She's a good friend oh. of mine, really good friend of mine. And she talks about this concept of home base. And home base is basically the one area in your house that if you keep it clean and organized, the rest of the house kind of seems to follow suit. Um, and I think that's kind of why intention seems to come up so easily when you're doing that is because intention is your home base when it comes to living your unashamed life, living a, a life full of confidence, peace, joy, um, spontaneity, all these good things that God really honestly wants you to experience. That's your home base is intention. Okay. okay. So are you saying like get clear on for those of people who aren't totally familiar with like the intention, intentional living, um, like, are you saying create like what purpose you want for your life, a goal for your life, a vision for your life? Like, can you explain that in just a little bit more? It's a whole, what do you want for your life? So goals, okay. visions, purposes, that all falls into, into intention, intention, all okay. of it. Okay. Because, um, oftentimes when you're dealing with trauma or the victim mentality, you don't feel like you can achieve things, which is part of the reason why it's so damning, you know, and by damning, I mean like full stop. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but the intention is literally those pinpricks to that dam that's starting to let the flow start coming back in again. And so, um, getting intentional about what it is you actually want to create in your life, not focusing on what it is you don't want, because that's pretty obvious at this point in your life. You've got to start focusing on what it is you actually do want. And one of the best ways, if you really, really want clarity, is to consistently ask yourself this question over and over and over again until the answer that comes brings tears like of this is what I want this is what I didn't think was possible right it brings up a lot of emotion a lot of emotion like almost kind of like a tragedy kind of emotion because it's been buried for so long okay and I've seen this time and time and time again too with coaching women um that once I start like okay we're gonna do a journaling prompt right now get out your journals what, what is it that you want? What do you want to create? What do you want? What do you want to create? What do you want? What do you want to create? And I just have them write and write and write and write and write. And after about the seventh or eighth time, and I'm not putting a number on that. Sometimes it takes longer, but normally around the seventh or eighth time, just tears, right? And that's when I'm like, okay, this is, this is your intention. Why this do you is think is that you is? Do they just unblock the, um, unblock the dam? Like unblock the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like, why do you think it creates so much emotion in somebody once they've kind of realized what they want for themselves? Like why, why would that create that? Because it's kind of like I said, you buried it. Um, when you're dealing with intense trauma, um, the things that you like, like looking at a life that you truly want feels unattainable. And so you bury it. So that way it doesn't come up and create and disappoint you disappointment and grief. And, Cause that's the last thing anybody wants to feel right. But, um, if you're actually grieving this and saying, this is something that I didn't feel was possible. That's actually your intention. 
<laughs> and that's what actually starts to come up. And if you'll hold on to that, it's almost kind of like resurrecting a dream. Ah, okay. Okay. And the second thing that I tell women is that thing got buried alive. It didn't die. <laughs> Okay, just because it got buried doesn't mean it was laying in that casket the whole time did. Okay, it just needs to, it just needed to be brought up. You can go ahead and go through that grieving, feeling like that's not going, like, really cleaning out that emotion of, or that belief that this isn't attainable, that needs to happen, otherwise you'll bury it again. Okay, but keeping it up is going to eventually shift the grief to possibility okay does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah i think so so like the emotions coming from grieving but then also realizing um this is real and this can happen and there's probably some releasing of of that grief and when you let out all of that pent-up emotion that's I can see now why they would start crying. I just yes. give me a minute. I'm like, why would we be so sad about that? Like that's, just, but I guess it makes sense because you're letting yourself grieve and feel those emotions first and then mm -hmm. moving into. Because you have to be able to cleanse that out. You have to be able to cleanse the emotion, cleanse the thought processes. Um, definitely bring a, t a box of tissues and a journal to this session, okay? Because you have to be able to free all of that, all of those thoughts, because the other cool thing, um, the thing that's been burying the intention is all of the lies, all of the misbeliefs about your life. And as you sit there and write all of these down, you're actually going to see all of the things that are out of alignment, which is that bounce back with the intention. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And yeah. all of those things that have been keeping it buried are actually things that you yourself can shift and change. One of those things may be a belief, you know, and this actually kind of comes back to your original question. Like, what do you do if your husband's not willing to change? Right. Getting clear with what your intention is and what's out of alignment with that intention and what you need to do to shift and change will actually give you an idea of what you need to do with your husband at that point. Okay. Okay. Um, if you feel like he's receiving truth, like again, the one that's hardcore is not going to accept any truth. He's, he's, he's not at that point. Yeah. But if he's in the middle ground or even the mild ground, if they're open to any truth, then you might have something that you can build upon. If they are not, on the other hand, you know, that's kind of where I say it may be a good idea to look and see if this is a relationship or a marriage you really are dedicated to saving. Because sometimes, and this is the second piece to this, sometimes the kindest most loving thing you can do for a person is to let them go out of your life. Do you think um, you're reminding me of Dr. Romani? She talks a lot about narcissists and it's nearly impossible to live with a narcissist. Um, there's a book that I read called uh, um, Loving the Self-Absorbed and it was extremely eye-opening essentially they said you can't change someone who is that way they have a psychological disorder whatever you want to call it that creates this uh, reality in their mind and it's extremely difficult to change this type of person and you have to learn how to change yourself to cope and to live with that person you essentially learn how to play their game and you turn the manipulation around on them and i remember reading this thinking this is so not fair <laughs> like, like I want them to change. They're in the wrong. They're the one that's hurting. Whatever. Why is it that I have to be the one to change? I, I felt like that was just the most unfair thing. And I also I get felt, that. And I also felt defeated. 
I felt like, but everybody oh. should be able to change. Like, that's just like, you're telling me to basically give up. And, um, it was a really interesting, if, if you, if you're dealing with a narcissist and you want to keep your marriage alive and you want to stay with your marriage, maybe that's a good book for you because it'll help you learn how to deal with them. But I don't know. Um, but how do you like, if let's say, what do you, what's your suggestion? Cause their suggestion is you turn the game around on them. What do you suggest? Like, let's say somebody wants to stay with that spouse because they do love them, whatever the reason is, there's a million different reasons why women have, what do you suggest they do to be able to continue not to be hurt and abused and tortured for the lack of better words? Like what can you do to, to live in that scenario? So the first thing I would suggest is don't settle for coping. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> I I don't do cope. I don't do cope. I do heal. I'm not saying anything against a lot of therapists. There's a lot of really, really good therapists out there. Um, that book but, rubbed me the wrong way. I'm just going to be totally honest. Like, yeah. A lo- to read. Yeah. Like a lot of the things you were saying was like, mm. <laughs> like I'm not saying like that. That's, yeah. yeah that's no, I know. Like it, it really did rub me the wrong way. I was having a really hard time for that book. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'd love is, different advice. This is why, this is why I don't recommend a lot of books. Like if you're looking for a book that helps with trauma healing, the one that I really love and recommend is called the peace giver because it's Christ centered. I love that. Book. I love that book. Love oh, it. Really good suggestion. We'll link to it down. Yes. Below, guys. Yes. That's, that's an amazing, amazing book. And that's got so many ahas in it. And that is a true trauma healing book, not a coping because yeah. what you were talking about is actually a coping mechanism. And that's not what women want. No, you want to heal. You want to heal. And therapists and all these gurus out there will teach you how to cope. And I I don't want to put a blanket statement. I actually know a lot of really good therapists, too, that actually do really good work. Um, And sometimes maybe your first step is coping. Like, it's kind of up to you, but that's not my, that's not not my forte. I talk about healing. And um, I'm hearing you say this is like a meme. We need to make a meme out of this. Coping is not healing. No, it's not. It's not one and the same. Okay. It's not. It's not. It's not healing. It's if I were going to define coping, it's just living, learning how to live another day with hell. Oh, it's surviving, not thriving. Yeah, it's, right? No, exactly. Appreciate and it, but it's true. Yeah, well, it's true. It's it's absolutely true. It's a survival me- mentality, and I don't want that for my clients. I don't want that for women dealing with trauma because um, that's a severe, severe, severe lie. <laughs> it is, and like I said, I I don't I don't deal with lies. I deal with truth. So the answer is if we, if she's going to have to stay in that scenario for whatever reason, even if it's just temporary, we're not going to learn to cope with it. We're going to learn to heal your heart. And you do that with the suggestions that you were giving. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Like I said, the peace giver talks a lot about actual healing techniques. That's such a good book. But um, I also love the New Testament a lot for, well, actually the scriptures in general. Like, um, I'm a Latter-day Saint. Um, I think about Nephi in the Book of Mormon and the way that he handled Laman and Lemuel. That's actually a healing technique. Um, I look at... Can you explain how he handled um, Laman and Lemuel? He was truthful. And, you know, you talk about Laman and Lemuel, they were actually in the middle category and they moved to the so Laman and Lemuel were Nephi's brothers mm-hmm. and they were extremely abusive to Nephi. They were always name calling, hurting him. They physically him abusive. Yeah, they were 
He yeah. on the boat and in the middle of a storm and wouldn't let his family untie him. And they got pretty crazy. They were constantly so plotting to kill him. In the middle. Yeah. <laughs> There's they that. they were in the middle for the longest time, but then they they actually decided to move yeah. over here towards the end of uh I think. Uh, I'm trying to think like I, I read the Book of Mormon every every year, but like it, I think it was in Second Nephi. I'm totally judging me right now. They, they left. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody's judging me right now. <laughs> but like they they moved into actually making good on those plans. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? And that's when like they they were they were on their way to just being completely. Okay, so what did Nephi do? Um to how did Nephi handle them that you think is a good way for us to handle people like that? Truth. He never faltered from the truth. He always spoke the truth and he straight up sometimes called them hypocrites. <laughs> but they Christ Christ did the same thing to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yes, he, he called did. them hypocrites to their face. But the thing of the matter is, is people think that that is um, cruel and unkind. It's not. Sometimes yeah, it's very confrontational, and it's hard it to be is. confrontational to those people. But you're actually not the one being confrontational. It's them that is. You're just simply stating the truth, and sometimes the truth brings out very uncomfortable things. And things that people are not willing to see. But if you look at the Savior, who is the most loving being on, that has ever walked the planet, and Nephi, too, was incredibly loving. Well, if they're going to call somebody a hypocrite, chances are they did it out of love. Because a person does not behave above what they believe about themselves, right? So you're calling out a self-belief right there. You're being a hypocrite. <laughs> Is that really in alignment with who you truly view yourself as? Okay, I have a scenario for you. Okay. A woman, I think Aaron's is how you and I met. We're in that Latter-day Saint Moms group. Mm -hmm. And um, a woman posted a scenario that got like over 200 comments. And some people were all for her and some people were like, wow, I can't believe you did this. She, her husband, I can't exactly, I'm going to probably butcher this, but she was ironing his shirts and he said something about her ironing. I can't remember what it was, but she basically said, that's not true. I, um, iron, whatever, whatever. She called him out and she basically mm -hmm. said, you're not being truthful. And then she said, and from now on, you can iron your own shirts. Oh, that's right. He was saying ironing wasn't work. And she's like, it is work. Housework is work. And that's very demeaning and belittling of you to say that my contribution to our family is not work. And she said, from now on, you can iron your own shirts. And after a couple of days, he came back to her and he said, if I give you a heartfelt apology, will you iron my shirts again? And she said, that's not a heartfelt apology. That's you just trying to manipulate me to get me to do what you want me to do. No, your consequence is that you need to learn how to respect me and what, and listen to what you're saying to me and listen to your words and you need to treat me better. So no, your consequence is you get to iron your shirts from now on. We're not going back to this. I, and I'm, I mentally high-fived her. <laughs> me too. I was like, I'm going to jump through my screen and give you a huge high-five, big <laughs> hug, and like cheer for you. Because I personally thought that was like the greatest thing. And then she got this comment, like, yeah, but your husband apologized. Like, shouldn't oh. you go back? Like, shouldn't you forgive him and let him and do his shirts again? And okay, so women, the reason I'm asking Aaron this question is because this is like, classic narcissist and classic abuser here, they will apologize to get what they want. Right. And they will, um, try to manipulate you and tell you that your emotions, right. Are being selfish and that you're, cause what did he say? He said to her, um, he tried to turn around to her that her having this like hurt feeling was 
manipulating him into an apology or something or into a changing and like, oh my gosh, it is the pot calling the kettle black moment. And so (laughs) for you, do you think she was in the right? Do you think that she shouldn't iron his clothes anymore? Like if you were in that scenario, how do you think you would have handled that? And how do we, um, because if you're going to stay in that type of marriage, you're going to have to learn how to handle people doing these things to you. Lots of scenarios like this. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that so that you, um, like you're saying, speaking truth, um, how do you do that? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yes. And again, I'm going to call back to, I'm going to go back to the two, like the different kinds of husbands, the husband that's on the mild side, he'll actually shift and change due to something like that. Like he'll actually be like, okay, I, I, I can see how I need to grow. And so that's actually a growth moment. And one of the most loving things you can do for that person. Okay. And he will actually come out and appreciate that. The guy in the middle, um, doing something like that will actually do one or two things for him. It'll shift him into more of an abusive mode or it'll actually humble him. (laughs) He could go either way. He could go either way. Okay. But if he's again, just straight up toxic and abusive, this is the guy that will retaliate to something like that. Hence another reason why I say this is not a relationship worth saving. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's got to come to, he's got to have his own come to Jesus moment without you there. Okay. One of the most loving things you can do for yourself, your children, him, whoever else is involved in this relationship is to get out. Okay. Don't so, gonna, I, so you disagree, and I and I do too with this book. Don't stay in that codependent, no, cystic relationship. No, no, no. Now everybody has degrees of narcissism, like right, and that's actually what I'm talking about here. Everybody has degrees of narcissism, but if they are hardened, um, they have no ability to feel empathy, sorrow, or empathy. And it's only going to get worse from there because they're completely taken over, completely blinded, completely taken over by anger, rage, negativity, all these things. And so um, that literally is putting you in jeopardy. And so I like if this woman would have done that with somebody like that, it would have been, it would have been, it would have, it was, she would have been dead, like just straight up dead. Um, luckily what I got from her husband, really, is that really he was, hurt. yes, yes. And so, like I said, just get out of that relationship. He kind of seemed like he was in the middle round. Maybe, maybe like middle, that. but on the more mild side. So for actually. he didn't ever really apologize. Um, said, well, if I give you an apology, is that we, the same thing as an apology? Cause in my mind, that's not the same thing as an apology. Well, we, 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 we have to kind of give some grace <laughs> to these guys, too, because I know my husband was, bless his ever-loving heart, he's the sweetest man, alive, good, hard worker, really, really good intentions, but man, does that man ever put his foot in his mouth sometimes, oh. <laughs> right? And that could have possibly, and I've done it, too, like, that could have possibly been just a big foot-in-the-mouth moment, and so. That's true. I, yeah. I'm go I'm going with that scenario. And so that's why I say it's kind of more on the mild side. The fact that he just even saw it and was admitting that, yeah, I probably should have been better. So um, do you think she should iron his shirts now? Or do you think that she's right in? I think she's right. Okay. Now, if it were me, like there's two, there's many different levels of rightness here. Like if it were me, um, if my husband would have come up and said, I can see that I was wrong, which her husband did. He, he admitted that. And if um, I apologize and truly do change, would you be willing to help me out again? You know, that can actually be a humble sta- humility statement. It can be. Um, but at the same time, too, I think she knows her husband better than the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And so that I totally agree with her in what she did. For me, I would have just said uh, I would have just made sure to set a very firm boundary there, too. Like what she did was perfect. But my boundary would have been with my husband. Yes. However, 
I won't be kind. I won't be so understanding the next time. So if you're going to demean me, just know you're going to be left a lone man in the Garden of Eden because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not playing that game. <laughs> right. And like I loved like I truly do love what she did because she knows her husband. She knows what it will take. She, I feel like she knew that if she would have picked it up again, he would went right back to his um, behaviors. And so, you know, I trust her there. I, I completely trust her. And that is an act of love to hit towards him, a love, love towards herself and an act of self-trust as well. And a step towards the right directions, because we think about boundaries. Okay, that was a like masterful boundary that she created. Uh, that was mastery right there. Um, but we think of boundaries as this thing to keep people out. It's not. You think about your fences. Okay, yes, they keep certain things out, but they have a doorway and a pathway that lead people in on the inside with you, right? Mm -hmm. People have to follow that pathway. Jumping over the fence is a huge boundary. <laughs> the violation. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, if I had, yeah, if I had a neighbor that, it, well, my lawn is horrible anyway, but it, if I had a nice lawn <laughs> and I had a neighbor that just decided to jump over and like, Pom, 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 and then just get like totally disregarding my garden, stomping on flowers, uh, kicking up my lawn. Yeah, I'd have a big issue with that neighbor, right? Sure. However, if they come through the front door, front, um, the the front gate, and follow the pathway, you know, those are people that are totally welcome, right? And I think about boundaries in a very similar sense. There's many different kinds of boundaries. Um, but in general, a boundary is something that is going to improve a relationship between two people. It's not something that's going to destroy the relationship. And so if your husband is like they might kind of throw a fit at first with your boundaries to see if you're really serious you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's like kids right they they yeah. test the rules they do they totally test the rules because they want to see if you're really serious and if you're really serious then guess what you actually are a safe person that's just the way people feel that's the way they've been wired to feel um but eventually if they're really invested in the relationship, they're going to use that boundary to get closer with you. If they're not, they'll blame you and blame you and blame you and blame you and blame you. And so really how you act in these moments with a husband who doesn't seem very willing to change, creating really, really good solid boundaries like what she did that was masterful mm -hmm. her husband sounded to me like he was going to kind of test the waters to see if she was serious but he's still ironing ironing his shirts now mm -hmm. and it sounds yes. like he's being a little more respectful too which is yes great. like yes. she she got him to understand this isn't and this is what my point to her was this isn't about ironing shirts this is not about a small thing. The small thing is actually a big thing because he's being mm -hmm. disrespectful and being demeaning mm -hmm. and you're teaching him to be kind. You're teaching him to treat you the way you want to be treated. Well, and, and the way that that's boundaries. Well, and truth be told the way he should want to treat her too, because it doesn't feel mm -hmm. good. Like I don't feel good about myself. If I will act like a total jerkwad to someone, mm -hmm. right? But if I'm being kind to people and I'm respectful of them and I'm loving towards them, even if I have to call up, hey, guess what? You're being a hypocrite. That's actually sometimes very loving. When I'm being that way, it actually teaches me about who I am. But if I am not, if I'm not willing to be kind, if I'm not willing to admit 
fault if I'm not willing to take ownership, hence another one of those pillars, right? Mm -hmm. Ownership is totally one of those pillars. Um, but if I'm not willing to take ownership for my crap that may or may not have landed on someone, um, that will never teach me about my intelligence, like who I truly am. I will never be able to be proud of myself. Never. And um, what she just did is she opened up a door for him to be better. To really step into who he truly is. To step into truth. What a wonderful thing for her to do. I love that. Way to, way to um, spin that so that it's... So back to our original question, which was how do you heal when your spouse hasn't apologized and how do you do it? You worry about healing yourself and you give Mm -hmm. them love and space and you speak truth to them and help them examine what they need to do to be better. And you speak that in such a kind and loving way. Right. Um, but then you let them have their free agency, Mm -hmm. honor the free agency, whether or not they want to Yes. And what they choose to do with the free agency as you change is really going to determine whether you can, whether you need to get out of the Mm -hmm. marriage or whether this is worth saving. Okay. That's actually where you're going to see the divide happen. People will choose in or people will choose out one or the other. Um, But the one thing I want to say is love is not always soft and fluffy. Sometimes truth cuts, but (laughs) if somebody has a infection that is literally boiling up inside of the skin, you've got to have a good physician to go lance that. Just because truth is cutting doesn't mean it's bad. It's going to cut and allow an infection to come out so that way healing can actually happen. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so being honest with someone is one of the most loving kind things you can do because it goes everything really comes back to the statement people do not behave above what they believe about themselves and so when I called my husband out on his crap sometimes because he would be like saying all like he stopped blaming me um, after a while but he started being really unkind to himself and which was just bringing down the energy. And so I looked at him one day and I was like, well, congratulations. Do you want me to agree with you that you're a complete buffoon and an idiot that doesn't deserve to live on this planet? And he was like, whoa, that was harsh. And I was like, well, that's what you just said to me. I'm just reiterating what you said. Well, no, I don't want you to believe that. Then why are you insisting on believing it yourself? Are you really the worst human that ever lived? Because if you are, let me know. I don't want to be with that person. (laughs) However, if you are the person that I think you are, which is kind, loving, sweet, hardworking, fabulous, good to his kids, a fantastic father. My husband really is all these creative a master manifester. Let me tell you, that guy can manifest things. Like I'm like, right? <laughs> How? How? I'm not an intention, right? Yeah, and a general. Like he is seriously a general of heaven. Like he is an. He hasn't realized that he's another Captain Moroni. Mm. He hasn't realized that yet, but he's getting there. He's getting there. And I said, if you are that person. Well, do you honestly think that person would be saying these things about himself, trying to elicit a pity party? Or would he simply just take ownership? Yeah, I've looked at porn today. I looked, I've looked at porn this last month five times a day. I don't like that about myself, but you know what? I'm choosing to forgive myself right now, so that way I can live at a higher intention And every single time I screw up, I'm going to choose to forgive myself 
and I'm going to love myself instead of hate myself because guess what? The hating myself hasn't done me any good. And when I said that to my husband, he was like, I've never thought of it like that before. And slowly, that negative self-talk has left. And now he is so kind to himself. And that's filtered over into me and our kids. And um, he's learning some really beautiful, beautiful lessons that are literally causing him to desire the porn less and less and less. And so when I say the porn is not the problem, it's the symptom of the problem. And once we heal, like women, one of the most powerful things you can do is heal. Because if you want your husband to change, I guarantee that once you heal your triggers and his the things that are triggering him are no longer triggering you, it does this cool thing. Like when you've got um, your triggers happening, when he acts in porn, it smacks your triggers, which smack his triggers, which smack your triggers, and they just keep going on and on and on constantly in this downward spiral. But once one of you chooses up it's going to knock his to go the other direction Mm, okay Okay. so every time i know we're at time but i have to ask this question so everybody bear with me you can hit pause if you need to hit pause and come back to this (laughs) again but but this is a really important question how do you not um feel betrayed each time he looks at the pornography again. Like, how is that not re-triggering your betrayal um, response? If that's the right word. You're going to make me cry. (laughs) Before I, when it triggered me every single time, it triggered a self-loathing inside of me, which I didn't, I didn't realize was really the case. But it just opened, like, just created more and more and more of this self-loathing. And, well, if I'm, I'm not lovable, I'm not beautiful, I'm not deserving, I'm not good enough, I'm not enough. But now I don't think those things. Like, that's not, that's not even something that enters my mind remotely. Some, like... <laughs> I look at myself and when I totally muck things up, that's literally like, well, I mucked that up. Okay, on to the next thing, <laughs> right? Because I've learned to love myself so entirely. I had, um, I talk about the four relational tears and I'm not going to go into those. Like if you guys want to know about them, there's actually, I have a whole entire podcast, like five podcasts on my relational tears, but links based- below. Thanks. Yeah, I'll I'll give the links, but um, they are the basic. Basically, you have four main relationships: your relationship with God, which flows into your relationship with self, which flows into your relationship with others, which flows into your relationship with abundance, and that pumps water or living water mm-hmm. back up into your relationship with God. Um, I decided to give my will to Him. That was my first decision. Um, And one of my favorite quotes is by uh, President Benson about men and women who give their lives over to God can find that he can do more with their lives than they can. And then all of the blessings that he lists. So go look up that quote if you guys want to see that. You got it. Yeah. Um, But I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. You know, I haven't completely done that. I've been giving all of my energy, time, focus to this problem and this pain. Well, what if I, and it's not been giving me a return. It's not been giving me an energy return. It's not been giving me an emotional return. What if I pulled that off and actually put all of that into God's will? What kind of a return would I get? And um, as I focused on building my relationship and trust with God again, um, he gave me one of the most beautiful gifts, which is I got to wear his God goggles for a minute and see myself 
the way he saw me, and this is where I'm getting a little teary-eyed, that was the most humbling moment of my life to see that, oh my gosh, I am amazing. I literally was in awe of myself to see everything I had gone through, to see everything that had been thrown at me, and to see the way that I've stood up to the adversary through every single moment of it. Um, and to see my kind heart, to see my ability to create, to see um, what I really truly am in the eyes of the Lord, that's not something I can ever deny again. And so to deny it, like I'm so linked to the Lord at this point. I to deny that I am incredibly lovable at this point is to deny everything I know about God. And I'm not willing to do that. And so when my husband comes to me now and he says I've been looking at porn, it doesn't even like register anymore that it's my fault. Because you've realized it's not about you. It's not about me. What is about me is what I think about me. And if my vision doesn't match God's, then I truly don't believe the statement, I am a child of God. Wow. Sisters. <laughs> I hope that deeps or sinks deep into your heart that you too are a child of God. And I believe that if you ask him to borrow his God goggles, as <laughs> you Aaron puts it, you'll be able to see who you are to him. And you'll be able to see that your husband's addictions and your husband's problems are not yours. All right. You'll be able to own what is and let go of what is not. And in doing so, you'll find the healing that Aaron has. And I think you'll be able to get to a point where she is, where you won't get triggered by the same things. I think that's a beautiful place. And I think we all want to get there. And luckily today, Aaron has given us a roadmap of how to do it and tools and ideas and things that we can do to to get there please follow those links down below to um, learn more about those um to get deeper into it with her i'm excited i'm gonna go as soon as, soon as she sends me those links i'm looking because i think it sounds awesome <laughs> and, amazing, and i'm so grateful for her advice and her love and speaking truth i don't know about you but i feel the spirit so strong right now telling us how much Heavenly Father loves us. Yes. And I just want to say one more thing, and that is you remind him of his most cherished relationship, and that is the one of his wife. You remind him of your Heavenly Mother. And that says something about the way he feels about his daughters. And he has such a protective instinct over you that if you ask and if you're truly willing to receive that revelation of who you are, boy, buckle up, <laughs> get ready, because that's going to shift so much for you. Wow. Thank you so much. You are amazing. Again, I know I keep saying that, but it's true. You are, you're such a bright light. And I'm so grateful that you were willing to be on the show and deal with the craziness that's happened today and be comfortable. <laughs> and you're just amazing. And I'm so appreciative of you and for, um, your kind heart and your willingness to share. Thank you so much. Everybody, I hope that you'll um, share this on your own Facebook or Instagram and, and you'll help those women out there that you know that are dealing with trauma that they can also heal and that they can 
they can learn these truths that they are a daughter of God and that they have worth and you have worth. And um, thank you again, everybody. And uh, I'll see you next week. See you guys. Thank you.